Prime Minister Modi's welcome in Qatar was a grand affair, bringing back visuals of uh, the Prime Minister in Arab nations of the world. Prime Minister Modi, touted widely by the Western media to be a staunch anti-Muslim leader, seems to have risen above the allegations as he is received by a crowd of people in Doha. The same thing happened in Abu Dhabi and even Egypt. He has been awarded the highest civilian honours by all these countries from Egypt to Palestine and has proved his popularity the world over. Now, as the Prime Minister heads to a bilateral with the President of Qatar, let's talk about how PM Modi is being received in the Middle East. Joining us to do uh, more justice to this conversation is Professor Madhav Nalapath, Editorial Director of the Sunday Guardian, Mr. Pathikrit Pine, International Affairs Expert, and uh, Group Captain UK Devnath, Defence Expert, joining us on the show as well. Professor Nalapath, I'll begin with you, sir. This uh, obviously is not only a change of <laughs> optics and perception, this is also a change of trajectory on how India and the Middle East countries used to deal with each other back in the days. Well, the fact is, uh, Vineet, that the India and the Middle East have historically had very close relations. We are talking of a relationship that goes back more than 1,500 years. And uh, it, is a, it's a very, it has been a relationship of warmth, of, uh, of friendship, uh, for a very, very long time. The fact is that some of the Western uh, countries, the governments of some of the Western countries, they saw the Middle East as almost a kind of a colony of theirs. And so in the past, you know, they, the Middle East, as was the South of theirs, and they resent the fact that a country that is a former colony, namely India, has much more influence, if I may say so, or, uh, you know, in the Middle East than they have. So newspapers, basically, they rely on briefings from anonymous sources within the government. And these anonymous sources absolutely are unhappy about the fact that India has a warm relationship with the Middle East under an independent-minded leader who basically looks at the Indian national interest. He doesn't, uh, you know, bend to any other national interest except the national interest of India. Now, it's very odd that these very same people who abuse India day in and day out, they fall at the feet of China again day in and day out. And they make all kinds of gestures to China. The amount of genuflection that is being done in the direction of Xi Jinping would make people believe that it is a People's Republic of China that is uh, a democracy, and India that is an authoritarian state, when the reverse is the truth. So I can only say, when he, I think we should ignore this kind of uh, absurd kind of of writings in papers like the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Guardian, etc., 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 Deutsche Welle, etc., for a simple reason, they are consumed with jealousy at the fact that the Middle East and India are such close friends. And what is surprising to me, they are absolutely delighted at the fact that China is now rapidly overtaking them in terms of influence in the Middle East. I really can't understand this riddle beneath. Right, absolutely. Pathikrit, your thoughts on, uh, you know, this, this uh, shift in attitude. Uh, obviously, the Prime Minister has been acting more than speaking when it comes to his, uh, you know, concept of uh, Vasudev Kutumkam. Uh, Vinith, first of all, uh, you know, good afternoon to you and my respected fellow panelists. See, number one, uh, you know, what Professor Nalapat mentioned is absolutely correct. But it is also a reality that over the last 40, 50 years, especially the 30 years uh, up till 2014, uh, you know, maybe at the behest of the West or, or there are these other lobbies, uh, Middle East was predominantly more pro-Pakistan than pro-India. And there was this stereotype that was created across the world, especially by the Western narrative, that India is... You know, uh, you know, a country which is inferior, third, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it has an economy which will never emerge. It, it will always flounder. You know, it is a country of snake charmers. Uh, that is the perception about India, and they have they have created a perception about Middle East that they are extremely conservative. It is a country. It is a place where which can only be in peace till the time the Western, uh, you know, influence over there remains. Uh, what has happened over the last one decade is that 
Prime Minister Modi has worked on two fronts. Number one, you know, he has worked in terms of, uh, you know, reforming India in internally, creating a far more resilient economy, which through difficult times has emerged even more stronger. He has empowered a significant proportion of the, in, you know, population which were deprived of even a basic bank account and basic capital. So that way what has happened that India has emerged as a far more uh, stronger economy through difficult times than probably what it was before that. That is something which the West has, and the Middle East does acknowledge. Secondly, you know, Middle East has its, the countries have their own information system to know what is happening inside India. So all the fake narratives that have been created uh, by certain vested interests that Modi is anti-Muslim, I think they know the reality that the Muslims have been the biggest beneficiaries of all the schemes, whether it is Mudra Yojana or uh, Awas Yojana or the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan or many other schemes. They have seen uh, how Kashmir has improved after Article 370 abrogation has happened. They also do realize that the terrorism, which unfortunately certain elements in Middle East also funded in the past, has hit them as well. You know, so they realize the challenge of terrorism. They also realize the challenge of, from the agents of regime change that tried to create uh, Arab Spring in Middle East and have tried to create destabilization within India as well. So I think there are areas of convergence coming up. From a time where we had a buyer-seller relationship between India only buying oil from there and Indians only going and doing menial work in Middle East, today it has evolved into a relationship of shared partnership and shared future. So it is not just that India is seeking oil from Middle East. The Middle Eastern countries are also looking forward to invest in India. They also want to, you know, decouple to a certain extent from their, you know, over commitment maybe towards the Western markets or the Chinese markets. And I think, let me tell you one thing, India's diaspora has always been a major strength of India. It is almost like an extension of India's external affairs ministry unfortunately before prime minister modi nobody ever considered that as a strength to leverage prime minister modi has done that so i think in many of the middle eastern countries uh, also have realized that you know uh, spirituality and issues or or the things that india talks about whether it is vasudeva kutumbakam or yoga or uh, service of bhavantu sukhina service santa niramaya Many of these Middle Eastern countries are also willing to embrace those things. Remember, most of these countries have a ministry called Ministry of Tolerance. And they've realized that uh, their obsession with Pakistan and the Western narrative has not helped them beyond a point. So I think there are areas of convergence building up. The most important reason why India is favored is because India does not interfere in the internal affairs of Middle Eastern countries, which has been a norm than an exception for the Western countries, and they are fed up beyond a point. So I think there are areas of convergence coming up. Of course, Vinit, there will be areas of divergence and status quo also. But I think what India is telling to the rest of the world, and especially Middle East, is that we need to respect diversity and celebrate diversity, and not just tolerate diversity, if we have to coexist and create a better world. So when Prime Minister Modi says that war should be the last option, you know, the temple that was inaugurated was not just a temple, it was an embodiment of Indian philosophy and ethos and culture, whether it is Mahabharata and Ramayana. On both the occasions, war was the last resort and was not the first, first resort for both Lord Rama and Lord Krishna. So I think a, a region called Middle East, which has suffered enormously because of conflicts, I think they find certain important lessons to be embraced from those uh, things. So I think both Middle East and India are coming out of the shackles of colonial legacy, and they are finding great areas of convergence with each other. India it has been a country which has always respected all other religions and has been a melting pot as a syncretic culture for all religions to come here. Likewise, Middle East is also evolving. I think in certain areas, we need to give them a little more time, but eventually, I think both are getting decolonized mentally, and that's what we are seeing today. Middle East will be one of the biggest investors in a more resilient India that is coming up in the next 10 years. Vinny. Right, and Group Captain Devnath, obviously not to forget that these countries are very optimistic about having India as the primary source of uh, you know, defense equipment as compared to you know, how the world and a number of these countries have already relied on China. 
Oh yes, Vinit, it goes without saying that uh, Middle East countries have now learnt that they should not uh, indulge in deep games with China. China uh, has uh, for a long time tried to ingress um, into Middle East by uh, any method. And now these countries have learned that any further uh, deep involvement with China may put them in deep difficulty in decades to come. They have found a very strong partnership uh, with India. They find India a very reliable uh, friend. Uh, Indian population, a large number of Indians, they stay in these uh, uh, Middle East countries. Uh, Qatar almost hosts 8,40,000 Indians uh, there. The bilateral trade with Qatar is increasing uh, with leaps and bounds. It has increased from $11 billion to almost $20 billion now. Uh, India imports huge quantity of LNG from Qatar. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, a, a pipeline is being conceived uh, from Qatar till uh, India up to Gujarat. 2,000 kilometer long under uh, sea pipeline. Uh, it is expected that uh, a total contract value will uh, be almost $60 billion in decades to come. As far as defense partnership is concerned, uh, all uh, Middle Eastern countries, in fact, entire West Asia is slowly learning that India is now a variable, very reliable source of defense equipment. We, uh, we have already exported Brahmos uh, cruise missiles to many countries. Tejas and Akash air defense system is being looked by all these countries with keen interest. Uh, they want to diversify. Arab countries and especially countries in West Asia, countries in um, Gulf of Persia, uh, they want to diversify. They have moved away from Russian, Russian equipment and slowly they want to wean away from American and uh, equipment and Chinese uh, defense equipment will become a big no-no in decades to come. India has a huge uh, opportunity to play there. Every time any delegation comes from these countries, they are taken to our defense establishments, defense PSUs, PSEs, and various DRDO labs, Hindustan Aeronautic Limited, and our uh, various shipyards to show that India can meet uh, their defense requirement very easily at a much competitive rate, and we can supply them with world-class uh, defense equipment. And uh, the uh, silver lining is that India attaches no, you know, um, there are no fine prints. Uh, we attach no strings in such dealings with our friend uh, friends in the uh, Middle East. Yes, Vineet? Mm. All right, those are live visuals coming in of the Prime Minister who is uh, going to be having that uh, bilateral. Professor Nalapath, your opinion and your thoughts on, uh, you know, the defence deals that are uh, in all likelihood to be a part of this ever-engaging and growing partnership with Middle Eastern countries? Uh, Vineet, I'd like to say that Prime Minister Modi unshackled the Indian defence uh, sector. Uh, it was shackled by the obstinate refusal of successive governments in the past to deny Indian uh, private industry the right to participate in the defence <clears throat> of their own country. As a consequence, we became dependent on foreign suppliers some there's some uh, sometimes very unreliable suppliers for about 80 percent of our critical defense equipment that is a huge security risk and that is now being very substantially rectified uh, under the, uh, of Prime Minister Modi over the last 10 years third term assuming that the Indian voters give that third term which uh, I, I, I hope will happen. The India is going to become a major supply of defense equipment. All right, Professor Nalapath, there seems to be an issue with your connection. I'm going to, in fact, go to Pathikrit now. Pathikrit, uh, you know, it's a very interesting terminology that uh, Professor Nalapath has used, that the Prime Minister unshackled the defence sector of India in, in a way that its potential is not being realised only by, you know, people within the country, but outside of it as well. Uh, Vinit, uh, absolutely right. Uh, you know, it has been rightly mentioned by Professor Nalapath. Uh, you know, for a, for a long time, India's defence industry was a mess. And the private sector was not allowed to come in. The defence PSUs led by OFB uh, were, were not good enough 
uh, you know, you can ask any veteran or a serving uh, military officer, he will tell you how the equipments were. Uh, and there were too much emphasis on imports. And there was uh, these middlemen who were ruling the roost. Prime Minister Modi dismantled the entire structure. Today, as part of Atmanirbhar Bharat, a large number of Indian companies, both large companies and startups, have started producing, manufacturing certain very critical components, you know, in the areas of drones and loitering munitions. Indian companies have done enormously well. There is a company called Solar Industries, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they have been producing, uh, you know, one million hand grenades, uh, which are far better than what the vintage grenades were being produced by one of the defense PSUs. So I think a lot is happening. Uh, you know, uh, in many areas, there are almost 3,000 such components, semi-components and finished products, which are now in the uh, negative list of import, which means they can only be manufactured in India, either by collaboration or by, uh, you know, uh, in, entirely by Indian companies. There are a significant portion of the defense allocation in terms of capital expenditure for defense has been allocated for Indian companies. So we see an exponential growth happening. But let me tell you a couple of areas of concern. The DRDO still needs to crack the code when it comes to an aerospace engine, or when it comes to an engine for a warship, when it comes to the engine of a tank. The DRDO has to remod you know, remodel itself, follow the template of ISRO, and do something worthwhile. It's high time DRDO does something. I mean, I have a lot of hope for the Kaveri engine, uh, which is now being partnered by Godrej Aerospace and some other companies. Uh, you know, I'm sure Kaveri would see the light of the day. Till the time we work on that, uh, I think uh, we have a lot, to, you know, a long way to go. But in areas of, say, missiles like BrahMos or Akash surface to air missile and many other areas, uh, I think India has done phenom phenomenally well. There are many Southeast Asian countries who are under the threat of China. They have evinced interest. Some have already purchased the BrahMos and uh, the Akash surface to air missile or the, <coughs> sorry, the Pinaka long range uh, attack rocket systems. And I think in Middle Eastern countries also, I think there will be a lot of interest. The most important thing about India's defense industry is that it will take time, its own time to evolve. But one at once it evolves, India does not have these binding strings when they sell something. Unlike the Americans, like the end user monitoring policy, they will monitor whom, on whom you can use. So I think Indians are far more uh, liberal in that way. And secondly, there are legacy challenges that Middle Eastern countries have faced from the cost perspective. So I think it would be too premature to say that Middle East will give up their bond with China or the West. What they are doing is that they're hedging their bets. So they will not anymore depend entirely on, on America or the Western countries or China. I think India eventually will also be a critical partner in many areas, including defense and aerospace. Remember in areas of, uh, you know, Satellite launching, India is a pioneer and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a very, very pivotal country to look up to when it comes to frugal engineering. So I think there are a lot large areas of collaboration which are coming up, but I would still say uh, it will take a little time. We have to be a little more patient. Uh, but yes, India's defense industry is one area where there's huge opportunity. Countries like UAE, Saudi Arab, they have the money and I'm sure they're looking up to India as an alternate uh, you know, manufacturer who can give them stable, reliable, uh, you know, goods, uh, weapon systems at reasonable price and with no strings attached. Back to you. Hmm. And, and Professor Nalapath, it's also, you know, to be considered and spoken of that why this temple that the Prime Minister inaugurated uh, just a few hours ago is a huge achievement. You know, uh, having lived in the Middle East, imagining something like this perhaps a couple of decades ago, was uh, almost next to impossible. Well, as Patikrit said, there was a, there's been a conscious effort to demonize uh, India and to demonize India as the country driven by communal conflict, uh, uh, demonized India as the country where the majority community is trampling over the rights of other communities, all of which, frankly, is in the realm of fantasy. The uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, understand the situation much better. They have sent teams here and they have seen that this is propaganda. And propaganda by, uh, by China and by its satellite, Pakistan. Now, the fact is, what Prime Minister Modi has done, if you are a friend of India, you are Qatar, you are Saudi Arabia, you are uh, Oman, 
you need not worry that the Russians will get upset at all. As for Chinese, frankly, the, uh, under Prime Minister Modi, India has given a very firm response to Chinese efforts at aggression. The, uh, the Arab countries have watched that, and I think they're, they, have, they immensely have respect and, if I may say so, appreciation for the way in which India has resisted aggression from China. Uh, uh, when it is taken, and it's entirely one-sided. The Chinese are behaving in an aggressive manner. India has never done that at all, especially under Prime Minister Modi. But the fact of the matter is, Russia, the Middle East and Russia, are very strong partners in many ways. Well, being friendly with India doesn't uh, affect that at all, because India is also fr friendly with Russia, and India is friendly with the Western countries. So Western countries will, will, will find it difficult to uh, basically criticize the Middle Eastern countries for being friendly with, with, uh, with Russia uh, in a situation where India is also friendly with Russia. And, and where, frankly, the criticism of India has come down very sharply ever since it was understood that Prime Minister Modi was right and he made that statement to President Putin, no less, that this is an era of peace, that right from 20... Uh, 20, 20, 2022 onwards, there should have been a ceasefire. And there would have been a ceasefire in April 2022 if it, if it had not been for the intervention of Biden and, and then Pre Prime Minister Johnson. Uh, the, India has always been the peacemaker. India has always been the peace seeker under Prime Minister Modi. This is appreciated by countries in the Middle East. And I think, you know, that kind of appreciation is driving the very strong personal connect between Prime Minister Modi and whether it's the, the, the and the Amir of, of the UAE, the uh, uh, you know the, uh, the the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, the the Amir of Qatar. You can see that it cuts across the board. Qatar may have problems with Saudi Arabia. It doesn't matter. India is a common friend of both, and I think this is the important thing about Prime Minister Modi. You balance relationship with Russia and the relationship with the United States. Hmm. You balance the relationship with countries in the region who are not friendly with Qatar. I think this is a remarkable kind of diplomacy. That And the reason for that is, this is the diplomacy based on sincere friendship. It's not based on selfish interest. Absolutely. <laughs> and of course, uh, the Prime Minister visiting this country after our uh, brave uh, Navy men were also released by them is, uh, is, is, is a great act of statesmanship and diplomacy. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.